Um, welcome to the this session. I think we could start to just uh, be on time as we we are delivering this festival uh, coming from England. So time is important. Um, yeah, I, first, I really want to thank you to be here to to listen uh, to me. Um, I'm very happy and uh, yeah, I feel a, a, an honor to, to be promoting the childhood festival that, uh, that is organizing Summerhill School, uh, celebrating the 100 years. Um, so it's a really, really a nice thing, a nice opportunity. And as it is 100 years, um, we are, I'm representing now a foundation that it's called Children's International Foundation for Research, Education and Peace. Peace. We are um, a small foundation um, that I was uh, yeah, moving forward from Norway when I was studying there. Um, so I, I will explain a little bit like what we represent and we, we um, started there from uh, childhood studies, yeah, the childhood studies field, which is an interdisciplinary field about childhood and children, uh, focusing especially on children's rights. Uh, but of course, anthropology, sociology, education, philosophy um, are like um, quite the, the biggest uh, fields are around to, um, yeah, to make society uh, um, able to listen to children. We promote uh, that children should be listened to. Uh, and I think that's uh, actually the same what we all want here to do, that children and in their education, they have a say and they can develop according to their interests and um, yeah, all the perspectives that we have now in a democratic uh, way. Um, so th this is the, the origin and we settled in Chile, uh, um, as I'm Chilean, I came here and I found uh, friends and we started a foundation here legally. And now we're trying to move to other countries actually. And, and we're moving, I, I must say hi to Leslie Guayasamin from Ecuador. She's there now helping and taking uh, the command to develop the uh, CIFRED, no? uh, Children's International Foundation for Research, Education and Peace in Ecuador. And we're looking forward, we have conversations in other countries. So it's a very funny thing that we started somehow in Norway in a very developed country that focuses uh, on children a lot, like uh, NOSEP, the Norwegian Research Center uh, of Childhood or children and childhood um, had a very important role in the research of, uh, with children uh, in the North. So we were born there and then we came back to more developing countries, right? And now we are talking actually with two people. I met also one of them in this master studies in, in a country in Ghana and uh, she's connecting other people in Ghana. So it's a very interesting thing that we now are moving like from developing countries back maybe to developed countries. So I'm very happy here today to, to present a little bit in, in a very short time actually. Um, yeah, what it is to, to have this idea, no? the, the name of this presentation, early childhood education in nature and in the city, benefits for children and society. Um, and First of all, I, I must tell you that I'm here in a, uh, it's good, maybe you could say pet zoo. Yeah. So I'm, I'm working with children. I mean, every day children come here and visit us. And there were right now two children entering to the farm. Um, and there was this goat who loves to jump out of the fences. So, the children were screaming, hey, the goat escaped, the goat escaped. And this is an everyday uh, experience. I said, oh, again, the goat ex <laughs> escaped, you know, to the people working here. So, and I think um, this is kind of what we have to do today. 
in education. We have to escape from the buildings. We have to go to nature, visit parks, uh, visit um, hopefully also more wild nature, but um, but also the uh, just the playgrounds. Use the playgrounds uh, as a. I mean, thinking about the pandemic and all the benefits that I will go more in deep into this, uh, that nature brings uh, to children. It's a great opportunity to leave behind these fences as there is a very nice Brazilian uh, edition of a book, which is called Desemparedamento da, da Escola, no? like breaking the walls, like Pink Floyd's uh, song. And, and why is this important? Um, and which are the benefits? No, I, I have here um, a resume of uh, a research that uh, has been conducted by uh, Kuo, Barnes and Jones. Uh, in 2019, it was open to society and they were, uh, yeah, it's a research about researches that have been, um, yeah, observing what's happening when children are outside and they have this exposure to, na to nature. Yeah, in different contexts, um, in a more free play in nature, in nature walks or uh, camp experiences and nature center programs, orchards, uh, forest education, uh, classrooms that just visit for a while, the garden, no playgrounds, animal assistant programs, and all this, I mean, a, a really bunch of research. I, if I don't remember, but it was like 200 research papers conducted in different qualities also. But at the end, they all uh, more or less show that he, this has a big, big impact on the learners. So I just remember this, this talk I went to um, with Pete Higgins, Peter Higgins, that is actually very close from you in Scotland at Edinburgh University, uh, talking about uh, nature education. And he said, guys, more or less like this, guys, you just need to go, you just need to go out from the classroom. Like go out, <laughs> go out and it will be better. Go out and children will learn more. Go out and children will feel, you know, all of the benefits I will go again, I will tell you about this, but how have we come to this situation that we have to uh, explain everything in detail and, it, and everything has to be researched. And, and I want to also provoke a little bit because being here in contact with many universities in Chile, they always say, yeah, but we have to research. We have to see the results, what's happening uh, with the children when they go out. Um, and it is enough, no? It's like, we should continue uh, researching the climate crisis so we, we know when we have to stop doing things. And no, we have to stop now. We have to act now. This is also, uh, an invitation to think how we can move the um, educational system into nature. Uh, it, it needs, and it's, it is urgent to face not the climate crisis today, as I read just a, a bit of a, um, of a report from Save the Children, and they said the name is Born into the Climate Crisis. But no, and, and then they, they wrote, we have to act now. But no, today we don't have a, a climate crisis. We have a climate emergency. It's another degree of the, uh, of the impact of the crisis. So the report is wrong from the title on. All what it's saying, it's, it's uh, true. But I mean, today we were not talking about a climate crisis. We we're talking about a climate emergency. And that's why this emergency has to touch us, everyone who is working in the educational system, although more or less in the system, more, you know, this, let's say beyond the walls or inside the walls of the system, but we have to really 
up now and take the children out of the classroom. And after all these researches that, um, that Kuo, Barnes, and Jones ha had uh, been looking at, they discovered that all these exposures to nature in different degrees and in different you know, atmospheres. Also, I wanted also to, to show you pictures from the desert, from the different areas that you can be in nature, in the city, and maybe with, with a little bit of grass or leaves. Um, but then, then again, it will be like trafficking and image that maybe it's not yours. I mean, you need to understand your own nature over there. You know? What is around you? What can you find? What is, I mean, in big cities, if you are there, it's quite more difficult to find a big place where you can go with children maybe in the neighborhood. Uh, maybe there's a small uh, place you can find and dig something you know, in the ground. But anyway, this is better than being inside. And I'm so happy that uh, Tanya Sopko is here because she's like uh, our uh, high frontier scientist who is checking uh, how the impact in a biological way is, in, is uh, like nature is impacting in a biological way our body and therefore our emotions and therefore uh, how we experience life at the end and how we can learn. Um, but anyway, all this research really is enough done, but I like uh, Tanya that you continue doing research anyway. It's very important. <laughs> um, all this research shows that in nature, children are able to concentrate more than in the classroom. Yeah, they show that they are less stressed. Very important, they show they are more self-disciplined. They show uh, they, they are more engaged in learning. They are more looking forward, eager to learn. And of course, they are more uh, physically active and fit. All, all this um, is just produced by going out of the classroom. So it, it's really simple, like how how have we come to this simple thing? And um, I mean, to have signs telling us, like, go out, go out, and we continue being in, be inside, and we can't change our habits. COVID and all the experience now, like how the virus promotes in, uh, in indoors, right, is also showing us Okay, but the opportunity is outside. Like there's a nice uh, Norwegian book that uh, said, I remember a paragraph, it's like all the hope is outside, talking about uh, uh, outdoors education and in nature. Because there is all this information that children learn more. So the context outside normally in a more a natural environment is calmer, quieter, safer. Um, it's warmer. You feel warmer, um, and the, it, it it begins to to because all it has a beginning. If I I don't go out for uh, from when I was a small kid, there is an environment that has been to be created, social environment. So it depends when we will go out, how that will all start. But anyway, the research shows that there is more cooperation when children go outside. And there, there is more autonomy. So children learn by themselves. And I think this is a lot, uh, I mean, we are here all, um, we believe in this, right? We, we are here believing in this. We like Summer Hill because it shows actually all what I'm talking combined with the interior, obviously, but it's also a very free way uh, to educate. But let's come back to the system. How are normally uh, kindergartens working in, the, in a normal system? 
it's difficult to talk about the worldwide educational system, but for sure there is a trend. You now in Scandinavia, uh, children go out more often. In Sweden, I mean in Finland, Denmark, Iceland, Norway, uh, it's 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 a big tradition that uh, actually it moved. Uh, to Scotland and England to start their first schools there after the experience uh, yeah, different people uh, had in, in, the, in those countries. So now the, the movement has gone, that went down many years ago, like 25 years ago to Germany. And today they, they have like 2000 kindergartens in nature in Germany. Uh, and then it, it spread to Italy where they, they have also uh, maybe 200, I don't remember exactly. And Spain, no, Gabriel can maybe uh, confirm there are like 50, uh, but it's moving and growing every day. So in, um, again, all those um, experiences and programs are not necessarily related to the system. No, I, I really am, I, I, I'm coming here uh, not as an um, uh, educator. I, I, I want to take the broader perspective, like a sociologist, no? because um, although this, all these impacts that I've been talking about, the learner and the context, um, I will go, go now to the learning outcomes are very important. No? The, I mean, the personal experience, the group, the collective, but at the, at the end, what we need is that the educational system changes. I mean, then we will have a, a possibility, uh, actually, I believe, to survive in this climate emergency or to this climate emergency uh, with, a, with a, a few uh, professors, we were laughing and they were saying yeah we need this uh, education for survival you know like and and the tv is showing you the survival <laughs> experiences and somehow i mean is it really um uh, but we are talking only about kindergarten age no no i i'm talking about uh, yeah a, a bit more actually maybe i i should focus on the kindergarten age um but I, I think as a, a foundation, I, I can explain the, because of the title, we are focusing on small children, on kindergarten age, because there is so much to do in the educational system in the whole world that there is where we can act first and then they will bring further uh, all the, their experiences to the next generation in primary school and they will develop. So. I, that's why we strategically decided to act on, um, yeah, in early childhood education. But obviously, uh, if more children in different ages go out, it's better, the better, no? Um, so the, the um, actually the um, achievements or the outcomes I've been talking that nature gives is not only for children in, in the kindergarten age is in, in a more general uh, perspective. And, and if, if you see, and you, you can start to talk about the nature um, yeah, shower, as we, we have been talking uh, with Tanya in, a small, in an interview we had not so much time ago, or this uh, woods uh, bath or you know, forest bath, um, all this healing process, it's very um, interesting because the healing process of nature being outside, it comes to the classroom when you go outside with the classroom to nature. So all the benefits that the body in a biological way experience uh, are helping the learners to have better outcomes. And this in the different ages, if you go out and you're very old, it will help you also. If you feel depressed, and you go to the woods or you know to the meadow you will come back home and you feel you will feel better but if you start this process in a very young age coming back to early childhood education you will have children that will have a better 
a muscle development that will be more um, agile, that will be able to, you know, to be stronger. Um, you will improve your immune system being outside in, in every weather. Um, but interesting is that it's not only the body and this like physiological uh, development that grows, it's also the mental health. It's also the cognitive in a more general perspective. Your memory, your memory improves. Uh, your language skills improve because you are collaborating, you are talking, but you, of course, you, have, you need the, the help of a, a trained educator that assists, that makes the, uh, the people comfortable, you know, feel comfortable, the children that they feel safe, but, but the, nature helps on this. So it's easier for the teacher to teach outside than to teach uh, indoors. No, you don't need to call the children to be silent because they will listen to you when you talk more easily. Why? Because we were saying, I was saying before, the research says children are more eager to learn. They are more aware. Um, they want to uh, listen to, you know? And there is also a, a, an important perspective, a basic about education. Of course, you learn more when you are self-interested. So when children play outside, that's their work. You now we say, you know, I have listened to this. Children's work is just playing, but it's not just playing. Playing has all these benefits. So they learn about leadership. So they learn about to resolve problems in, in the group. So they collaborate. But coming to the learning achievements, they have this memory. So they increase the retention of the subjects. No, they, they will remember the matter more. Um, they higher standardized test scores. They have better grades. They, as I said, they improve their reading, math, writing skills, higher graduation rates. I mean, this is hundreds of research that are showing this. There is a better, um, in the personal development, leadership skills, as I said, yeah, better communication skills, more resilience, better critical thinking, yeah, and problem solving, uh, better sp spatial skills. And of course, there is a stronger connection to nature and a stronger environmental values. So you're more pro environmental behaviors. All this leads um then two children that will be willing to uh, work for the environment that will have um, a stronger consciousness about all the situation that we are experiencing now um, so we are talking when when changing the system again or let's say when improving the system, it's not that we want to change everything, but if you take the children outside and you improve their learning and you improve their emotional experiences in life, you, we will have an amazing impact in, the two day, in two days uh, childhood. And a better childhood will be happier adults, uh, healthier adults. So we, we, we can talk, I love Kata, your cat over there. We can talk uh, about a generation that will be more focused on all the benefits, collaborating, taking part uh, and, and working for the better environment, uh, more consciousness, you know, like it's, this is um, also what I've been talking a long time. It's a, a loop. I mean, it's a quantum loop that we can do if we focus on early childhood education and we have a stronger <clears throat> connection to nature through a, a transformative educational um, program you know, that has a huge impact if we can have it as an educational system. 
I'm very happy because uh, of COVID, I can tell you, I, I read, um, you know, Karen Malone, I guess many of you have heard about her. She has been researching the Anthropocene. I didn't come to that. Uh, and children and childhood, no? Childhood nature, that's a concept maybe you have been listening to. Um, so she's uh, starting a national uh, board to act uh, in Australia and, and give the government you know, and the state solutions to bring children outside uh, to the outdoors because of the coronavirus crisis, the pandemic. But this will have a very positive impact on the learning uh, of, of this generation that goes outside if we do it uh, fast enough. Probably many will, um, and you know, uh, there, there has been a lot of research also about the negative impacts of the crisis being inside all the time, quarantine, lockdown inside, you know? Uh, and this, um, of course, there we need uh, what I like also this concept, the uh, emergency uh, pedagogy. Pedag no? Have you heard about this concept? So there, are, there is these people that help children in um, conflict zones and wars, uh, migrants. So they give them a kind of therapy. Um, so th this part of the generation that has been suffering a lot inside, maybe we will need a lot of work. But the others, if we start the change and we improve the system by just as scientists are saying, go outside the classroom. Uh, just by doing that, we'll have a generation, a childhood that will connect and maybe will bring us forward in this educational loop. Uh, so we, we can maybe have a yeah, very interesting thing from here now in 20 years, but we have to start to act now. So what, for example, this uh, student that uh, contacted me and wanted to research the neuroscience. You need to develop the brain, not only listening to the teacher in front of you. Uh, you need to develop the brain on smelling, on touching, especially in the early years. I'm coming back to the early childhood education. Yeah, Taste, listen, be aware, uh, trying, I mean, this, um, feeling of um, asombro, it's called in Spanish, no? This feeling of discovery, of uh, the feeling of, and the possibility to explore and, and to really see things and smell oh, how, and you know, share these uh, marvelous uh, experiences. Mm, it's basic for a healthy brain. I mean, how can we develop the brain if we are not listening to the birds or to the wind, to the, you know, feeling the wind? You need to, with your whole body, to feel the wind, to feel the cold, to dress properly. Uh, yeah. I mean, you have to, to be able, and it's a very simple example, when you listen to a bird, you can then go to the book and check which bird is that, or go to maybe a technology tool. Um, but you will not um, have the same connection to the animal if you are inside, or you just read hundreds of names of you know birds and animals that maybe you will never see because they don't live where you live. So you need to experience your own as a very small child your own environment to really take care about it later because you engage with it because you experience so many nice uh, stories that you share with your friends. So all, all this being outside is just being outside with a um, grown up that, that take cares about the group that prepares food maybe on a fire. Um, and all that will be there with the children for the rest of their lives. So, of course, 
all these experiences as a very young child, um, as a very young, let's say, green generation, we can talk maybe, this starts to be applied more everywhere. Mm, all this will have a really huge impact on, remember also this study, I, I just came to my mind, this study that's, that, that said, this generation now is the first that is, I don't want to say, it, but I, I will say it anyway, more stupid than the generation before. No? There is this, this uh, research stating this. And why? Because we are all condemned to the phone, to the, we are inside listening to each other. Imagine all these conferences now, and we don't have the opportunity to go out later and drink maybe a beer or just, you know, connect with each other, talking about, ah, what have you been doing? Which research I have been doing this and connect and coming with new ideas. So this is the nice thing about uh, being in, uh, in connection with each other, to share, to develop, to grow ideas, to yeah, be critical, to listen to the difference. And these are all things that in through the uh, nature pedagogy is kind of basics. You know, you're outside, the children can talk to themselves. They are the learners, so they uh, play. You know, they start to play what they want to play. You can have some activities, but they will um, be in charge of developing the more or less, of course, the adults is in charge, but the children are more or less in charge of developing and connecting with the adults and sharing ideas, what they will do, where they will play. And uh, so all this freedom, and because now we're talking also about um, freedom in education with IDEC, and now democracy and sharing is so important. Um, that's also demonstrated. Uh, we have come to this level of development because we share and we um, collaborate with each other. Instead, coming back to the system and the traditional learning, we are competing. We are not sharing. We're not. This is changing, I think. I have seen many project-based uh, mm, yeah project-based education uh, experiences but still it's we're still going you no know, to to the outside uh, deciding what we want to do i mean the system must um maybe copy a little bit more faster and more things what summer hill has been doing a hundred years <laughs> you know, like <laughs> the children can just uh, decide what they want to learn and, and to study or if they want to play and they will come back to the learning afterwards. So again, I feel a little bit strange in this, um, um, in this conference because, or this lecture, because we all know about all this. You know, we all agree and we have to change or help to transform the people that are outside, that they don't know about Summerhill, that they don't know about nature education, that they, they don't know that just going outside the classroom is improving the learning experiences. And this is the word we have to spread. And I, I was saying this, this is connected to, to, the, to society. Because, I mean, it's obvious, but if all this generation and more people go outside and they learn and the children are happy and they have this amazing childhood. In Norway, I remember they say a good childhood is a childhood that was, you know, was a lot being outside. A, a childhood in nature is a good childhood, they say. Well, they say also that children are born with skis. So from the very young age, children are outside. And then we have to see if that's more or less the, the society we want, a more free, open society or not. But the impact of being outside and learning outside is having an impact on how society develops. So when I go outside and I learn that I shouldn't cross the street light when it is on red, 
This will help that less children die uh, on the streets. This will help that the cars will slow down. Um, and this will help to improve how the traffic system works in countries like this one here in Chile. You know, it's not um, just telling the people that you should, uh, you can have a fine or whatever, it's having the experience to be outside, stopping. And, the, and I mean, Chile is quite developed compared to many other countries in this sense. You know, I was talking with these friends in, in Ghana uh, to develop a nature education over there. Um, and she was saying, yeah, we have uh, so much uh, nature that people don't see that as a place to learn. So it's a conceptualization uh, a consciousness that we need to work with the parents so they understand that you can do that everywhere. I mean, you are not educated because you're visiting a, a classroom. Harvard is not famous because of the classroom. It's because they, because they get the brilliant minds that come there and they share their, their ideas, no? But, so again, this, all this development has an impact on society. I said the early childhood education uh, teachers and yeah, teachers of teachers I've been working with a little bit this last time. Guys, when you go outside um, and you are outside with the children, you see what society is giving them like Francesco Tonucci has been talking right from Italy a lot about children in the city and how the city should be a place where children can feel safe. Because when children can feel safe outside in the city, it will be a city that's good for everyone. Not only for the children, also for the oldest, in, no, oldest generation or older generation. But cities are normally done for the average working class between let's say 20 and 50 and, and all the rest is ignored. Normally, I'm, you know, I, I think in, in an average world, it's like that. Uh, so if we go outside and I, I said the educators, you will check all the problems you face. You know, you, you, you will be a tool of um, improvement of society because you will know what's happening to the children when you walk through the streets. You know that the street light here is, for example, not working or the, that there is no street light. So you can give children a voice and tell the mayor, tell the politicians, work you know, with the educational community to look for um, solutions. When you go outside in, in a kindergarten that is in the middle of a um, city, a big city, urban uh, space, and there is no park, and you know you're walking for two hours and there is no park, well, today we are talking about biophilic cities. So we have to search for places where we can build that park, because if not, we are not giving the best opportunities to those children to develop, you know, to have a bigger, better brain, better connections, uh, better learnings, etc. So it's very unfair that as educators, we stay inside, we don't go out and we say, no, we have been doing everything we can inside the classroom, so that's my job. No, I think educators can help to improve society, should be feel, should feel responsible for improving children's lives and, and the childhood as a generation, especially now when we are in, in, in the middle of this crisis. No, it's, it's a real opportunity to give a voice to children um, and to improve society with children. And, uh, Luckily, as I'm working here I, with children, I observe and we're doing that. And I, I feel very in the wave of helping bringing trees to kindergartens, helping them to go out, identifying risky zones, you know, and 
telling the majors, hey, we should bring children out and helping. But it's not uh, the majority. We are still a very small uh, movement. We were still, uh, although, I mean, we have reports from the 60s and 70s that are telling we should go out, we should uh, improve uh, our awareness about the environment. And every day, I, as I was saying, more, more, and more. But still, it's very small. I still have problems to find uh, books in, in Spanish. Spanish, which is a huge language in the world. And you don't find many books, you know, you find them on English, on yeah, Swedish, Norwegian, German, Italian now a little bit more. So everything we can do, everything um, we can create more awareness will help children to have a better life, better learning, um, and this will also be a way to have, a, hopefully I'm working for that, and I guess we are all working for that, to have an amazing generation that will become greener and responsible for the environment, and, and that will be, um, we're working to this breakthrough, you know, we have to change the direction, um, creating awareness and acting uh, now, so mm, how how can we deal with these um, experiences? How can we create the cultural conditions that this is accepted? Is we have to promote it. We have to share. Um, be I mean, this is coming because it's it's just um, an emergency, but. I've been looking at documentaries. We, we are sharing um, ga, um, yeah, small uh, information books that we have been translating and we're working on creating awareness among uh, educators. Um, and I hope you, you can do that also. I don't know, um, I think I, I'm a little bit, uh, on time now, like I should talk 40 minutes and I could continue, but um, I, I would like also to have a small discussion. I think it's very important to listen to you if you have, I guess, many interesting points. Uh, Tanya, please don't make different difficult uh, questions. <laughs> yeah. Now, just to compliment, you know, like it, I think it's, um, very important that we can also participate. It's a democratic uh, a festival. So if someone wants to say something, Tanya, I see you, you have your speaker on, please. <laughs> well, Matthias, congratulations. And uh, can you hear me well? Very well. Because I'm sitting outside, you can see we have beautiful, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm in New Zealand. Um, so what I would like to say that congratulations to what you're doing in Chile. And I remember when you started, it was nothing, right? <laughs> it was you trying to convince people, how do we do it? And, uh, and I think what is important you're doing there that you kind of created a group of people that you are leading now. I remember Paula, for example, she was just doing her little groups. Now she has a school, she has, a, she has her own program and a number of other people and now Ecuador and, and other places. And also, I, I think as ambassador, I think it's very important that you are not only doing things in the in your Gran Aventura, that actually you are doing, um, you're going further, you're trying, you're working with the universities, of course, but also like you do try to, to change something in your government. Like you and me, we, we were sitting there with the government and actually almost convinced them that they need to, to invest more money and to have more programs of this kind. Unfortunately, it was just before the COVID happened. But I think it's very, very important that you go on different levels and uh, you don't need some people do research like me but i think people to be hands on on uh, on the uh, there and do things both like you say with children with educators and on the government level so i do think it's really important and i really would try to support you in any different ways and i think i hope many people would support you thank you Tani. thank you very much
I, I, I think this, unfortunately, is a worldwide problem. No, it's, I mean, I, I was always thinking when I came back here, the impact of Chile in the world is like 0 0.1. Like if we all change and we are the greenest country in the world, um, that's uh, not having any impact. I mean, in the results, uh, talking just very rational. But of course, it will have an impact in the region and people will want to change things, right? Like in other countries closer, they are doing this, it's going well. I was talking about the, the learning outcomes and this is, I mean, it's proven. So we just need to start. Um, I don't know if, if there is somebody who didn't know so much about nature education or Gabriel who knows a lot and has Playa Escuela uh, in Spain, maybe wants to share also some ideas, comments. Yeah, or Jason, please. Um, yeah, I'll share. Uh, I am in Texas in the US and uh, they've started, I don't know how long it's been going and I didn't catch the beginning of your presentation, but there's a organization called the Free Forest School and it's mostly geared for homeschoolers, but I think anyone can participate. And their goal is to get every child outside every day for, I don't know if it's 30 minutes or an hour, but at least get every child outside. And I think it's wonderful. Um, and they have lots of little pockets. So you can like be a part of a group, you can do it on your own. Uh, and they just go to parks and they just hike and just get outdoors. Um, and I believe it's called Free Forest School. And there's another one called Out Wild Outdoors. Um, so there's a couple and that just makes me hopeful that maybe that will start to seep into the system and say, wait, yeah, parents are doing this, this works. Let's do it at school. Let's do it in conventional settings. Um, and I do it with my students whenever possible. Uh, last year, we really got into mycology. We just started walking around, found a bunch of mushrooms, and then we explored that. And it took us for like a three-month adventure into the world of mycology. So I appreciate your presentation. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, it's, it's true that I just want to, I mean, there are coming many projects and programs I, I, I've been experiencing it myself, but we need to act as a system. You know, it's, I mean, of course, many programs, many, uh, maybe we are impacting that way, the system, but we can't, I mean, I haven't heard much about like what I was talking um, that is happening in Australia, like this movement uh, of, um, taking children outside because of the coronavirus. I mean, the, as an opportunity to be outdoors and recommend. I mean, this is a very high level scientist, no? who are uh, coming together and sharing. Um, and I guess they will say, number one, go outside the class. <laughs> it will be, I mean, it's not so difficult, right? But, um, but this is, yeah, I, again, and that's why the benefits of the being outside are as an individual, very clear, that's group collaboration, you know, and all gain, um, and then the impact on society. But if we do this in a more systemic way, systemic way, uh, there will be, of course, uh, it's so interesting what could happen because it's a world I, I it's difficult to imagine like the, the impact after 20 years, you know, like doing very strongly uh, like or elevating the concept of nature pedagogy, like very strong. It's, uh, it can be very, very interesting, like because the impact has for example, what I'm working here now, my goal is that we work four days and six hours a, a day. You know, like we have to, we, we don't need to work so much to consume, consume so more, so much more. We need to be content with what we have to be, you know, like the here and now is so important. Um, and this is what we lose when we go into the classroom or, if I had a presentation where I just show this, that, the benefits, and the next, and it's like, now I, I decided 
but I wanted to do it more freely, to feel also free to share many ideas. If not, I have to, I'm condemned to what I'm showing there, you know, in the presentation. Yeah, there. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's so important that spirit, mind, you know, like the heart, all is connected and, and edu the education and all, mm, well, the science is only making all smaller, smaller, smaller. So at the end, we're talking about, I don't know, the blue grain that is growing in the rice of something somewhere, you know, and we we'll have lost the whole perspective uh, of this amazing concept that Tanya actually has told me about the One Health, and she's talking for sure on her presentation about this more in deep, not that, that we are in, indeed all connected all the time. A friend of mine, she's working uh, at, uh, in Norway, also neuroscience and um, pollution. She was researching different countries and, and she discovered, yeah, the brains, in some areas that have a lot of pollution are developing less. So children uh, have problems, you know, uh, or could have severe problems actually. So th there is so clear, if you, you are in nature, you can grow, I mean, you know, in a very good way. If you are more in a polluted area, you will have problems. So we, so we have to, to take this very seriously because the crisis is a lot of pollution. Is um, I was reading also to statistics how um, fires or the 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 chance of having fires, uh, hurricanes, um, you know, and earth floods uh, or um, floods um, will increase more and more, like because of the climate emergency. Gabriel, you wanted to say something. Hi, Matthias. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Matthias. And I was looking to know you or to meet you already quite a long time. Happy that nice it finally happened. Um, for me, um, I used to, well, look like at the critical points, what you just said, like, okay, the movement, especially in Europe, um, I have been myself trained in Germany. I worked in Germany in the forest kindergarten. And I know a little bit the movement there and um, it caught my attention. And this was a little bit also why I asked at the beginning of your talk, if we only talk about kindergarten age, because look at the movement in Germany. And I think we can include the rest of Europe, at least that um, when we talk about nature pedagogy or nature education or nature schools, I think more than 90 percent of the projects, even in Germany, which has been for 30 years, and there are thousands of schools, or let's say two to three thousand, for big decades now, we still talk at 95% or more. I, I just know very little, or not even really, projects which go beyond the six years. So it's uh, still seen as something for, kinder, as for, for kindergarten age there. So I think this is um, a crucial aspect. Because um, even if people don't there know all the benefits and all the stuff that you said, there is like commonly known and, and people accept it, but still most of the people say, okay, when you, this is okay, like for the first years for early childhood, but afterwards you have to sit down and study. And this is still very common there, even in a land, in a country where the, where the movement is so, so popular and so successful actually. So this is uh, calling my attention, and this is where I think um, the, the democratic approach comes in, because this is uh, what I'm really worrying about, and what I see, for example, now that I moved back to, to Spain, and I'm here with our own project since 2016, and, and when we started in 2016 in Spain, we were like one of the first nature schools in whole Spain, we were like one of the first, let's say, five nature schools, and now five years later, they are like more than 40 or may maybe 50, as you said, okay? Mm -hmm. So there was like a, right. in the last five years, like, like a huge boom. Well, huge is maybe not too much, but there was like a, 
exponential um, growth. But what we see, for example, and again, I may be a too critical, but what we see in this movement is that we use like um, approaches which were designed for interior, for indoor schooling, where you have to like fill in uh, material and programmation, then we adapt this kind of um, didactics or uh, pedagogical approaches, which were designed for rooms, we have to refill. Um, they, we try to adapt them to nature, like we take them out, we, we convert them into nature environment. And this is what really concerns me because it seems that we have to justify our like um, natural environment doing some kind of schooling. And this happens a lot in this. And so we do like normal teaching just with natural materials. And this is something I think the whole movement is still like um, really attached like to, to the conventional schooling idea. I mean, yeah, free play is quite a big thing, but still like the, the paradigm shift, in my opinion, in this nature movement has not really arrived. I still see like many workshops about nature pedagogy, which are called like nature and curriculum and reading and writing in nature and like, like teach in nature, you know? And so this is why we call our school, we are a free democratic school in nature. So the self-directed learning and learning is again very associated to well learning something like self-directed development. So this is I think these are key aspects um, why this nature movement is like still a little bit stuck in this initiative phases. Sorry, I yeah just mm. wanted to bring this up. And if you allow me, I would share because like um, the benefits you just like. Um, shared with us i have like um a table which i took out of a book where all the studies or well many of the studies of benefits of nature for for childhood are listed in different areas so if you don't mind i would share yeah. the link so people no, with of interest course. I, download it i i went to just one research that's that's very recently and had one figure because there are so many uh research that i could uh, I mean, try to combine, of course. Uh, please share it. Feel, uh, yeah, welcome. Um, I think you are very right when you are saying um, that uh, it's very like adult uh, oriented, no? Or like uh, decided what is going to happen. I mean, especially I think in German. Um, although this idea of free play is growing and growing, still here, the problem is, I mean, we have the problem of free play, but we are also inside. <laughs> That's why I'm, I'm, I'm making this discourse and my approach from my experience, you know? Uh, for example, Mm, what I experienced in Norway was because I worked in different kindergartens, not necessary um, nature kindergartens, but a normal state owned kindergartens. Uh, each kindergarten could more or less choose uh, the philosophical perspective that they wanted to use. So more were radio oriented, others were more um like normal uh, like norway let's say oriented um also well montessori I don't remember much but others well that was private was more <laughs> english oriented <laughs> but what i want to to say is that um in different societies you have different perspectives <clears throat> in finland you have a much more free education and you <clears throat> right they organize themselves as i said as um a project-based approach, much more in groups and developing projects with different technologies involved. Mm. So I think, especially now when we're we're talking about democracy and more um, free, uh, uh, yeah, democratic approach, the nature perspective has to, as you yeah, as you well said, has to you know be combined with uh, with this uh, yeah free organization with uh, respecting the rhythms of the child and the interests um, and 
I think it's, as I said, I said in 20 years, we will have this loop. We can have uh, an amazing impact um, because, but we have to act now. We have to have a system transformation fast. And that means not only in early childhood, but if we, if we have a very early childhood, I mean, like my, my personal goal is that the early childhood has a very nice, you know, uh, development uh, according to nature and of course to democracy and uh, participation and listen, and children being listened to and that they can develop their own projects and programs and yeah. Uh, so diminish this adulthood uh, childhood difference no it's very important um, but as foundation we haven't although we we have been doing a little bit with uh, yeah young young people um one of our, our goals is also to work with young people especially related in things related to um, the United Nations Convention on the Child, on the rights of on the child. Um, because it, it is there that they, they have these rights to say, to talk, to participate, you know, to, to take decisions in all things that are, that matters, that, uh, that where they are involved. Um, but uh, we have been working much more just in this very, you know initial stage because we see that we if we start there we can like as a, in the future have an a bigger impact uh, on more people uh, so i think um well now it comes to all these ideas of democracy are we really democratic in the society which one is really i mean is this real democracy we could enter to that more philosophical discussion uh, is uh, Switzerland with all these, um, you know, uh, elections more democratic, really, or or maybe not? That I mean, we could enter to that. And um, but I really appreciate your your point, like nature and um, the children's decision, what they want to do every day, what they want to play, what they want to research, uh, is fundamental so the 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 development is not only the biology that is working properly and you have a nice brain and you know like the muscles are okay uh, no we we need also um an intellectual uh, development where freedom uh, uh, of choice um, or the decision to to do things to create you know art is so important we haven't talked about art uh, but it's so important also to connect arts with nature and music, for example, uh, dance, uh, so many things that that makes yeah makes us uh, humans. No, I mean culture so important. It's not that we go to the woods and we are there and we we only play. I mean. Again, it's not just playing. There are a lot of things in the free play, especially. You know, it's a lot of developments, uh, but we we have to incorporate. And actually, the title was "Children in Nature and in the City." Uh, and in the city is where you find the museums. In the city is where you find uh, music groups. I mean, you can find them in the woods. Very strange. <laughs> it can happen, <laughs> but it is in the city, in the parks, where you uh, again. You have this, um, you know, these experiences. So, so you have to also experience the city, I think. Um, and this brings, as I was saying, the these um, solutions. I mean, when when the teachers they are listening to the children and they bring solutions uh, to city planning, uh, you know, according to this more like bio biophilic city. Um, or they bring solutions because they are listening to the children. So they organize and maybe they want a different playground or they want, you know, a different uh, experience and they want to co-create a society more with the adults. Um, this is also part, I think, of, uh, of the benefits, you know, of the benefits of nature. 
education because nature education is not only being in nature. Maybe it was not so clear. I, but again, this is also my personal uh, opinion and perspective. But what I've been observing in different groups, I've been uh, yeah, visiting actually in Australia, uh, in uh, Italy, in Norway, here in Chile, what we do. Um, in, yeah, is that you, you are outside in the woods or in nature a lot, but you also go to the city. And I, I have to send greetings to Paolo Mai, who I visited uh, a few years ago. And we went to Rome. And you know, Rome is a museum in itself. And the children were going everywhere uh, and discovering and then talking about history. And they visited uh, theaters. So it's, um, they choose to represent, to make arts, you know, they also have their own representations, uh, dramatic representation. And, and this is, again, talking about summer here, our areas, you know, the crafts, the um, ceramic and uh, creations, it's, it's also part of the, the history that they, they had lessons and they have um, atelier and they can create. So th this, uh, and again, this, um, I remember this idea of um, where children create their own playgrounds, no, after the war. It is also a very nice experience where they develop uh, the decision and they experience uh, democracy while talking with the, with the children. Yeah, Tanya will be talking about uh, evidence-based research and the benefits. So, yeah, fun fundamental uh, experience, democracy and nature, of course. I mean, if you talk the, I, I, if you take the, all the Chinese out of the classroom and they do the same as they do in the classroom in nature, as I, I've seen pictures with all sitting in the woods, writing, you know, in the desk, I, I don't see any, <laughs> any solution on there, in there. Yeah, yeah I, I think we, we are arriving to an end. I don't know if anyone wants to say something else. I appreciate I'd like you. to ask you a question, Matthias, um, from Brazil. And I think part of it you already mentioned, which is about how to do it in the cities, like how to make uh, education in nature in the cities. As I, I believe that children in the cities, maybe they even need more more contact with nature and there is a more a bigger need of being outside because we tend to be more inside. But there is one thing that worries me, which is like um, security has been a problem in South America and especially in Brazil at the moment. And I think it, it's, it's so important that a child feels safe when they go outside and they go for a walk. And I can, I can talk about my children. They don't feel safe because I don't feel safe. And it's not that I live in an unsafe area. It's known to be a safe area, but they witnessed last month a kidnap right in front of the building while they were playing at the balcony. So our neighbor, it happened right in front of them, like with a gun and cars and then the police and all the atmosphere of feeling in danger. We, they are seven and six years old. Like, how can I convince them that it's okay to go for a walk to a museum that is like uh, two squares from where I live? That they don't want to go, or if they, they they want to go in an Uber. Now, can we catch an Uber? Because the and it's understandable. And I, I'm really struggling at the moment with many things. Like we talk about democracy and I truly believe I'm not like, I, I, that's exactly what I believe, but I feel so uh, hopeless at the moment, especially with the, our political situation in Brazil. Like we talk about democracy and we want children to grow and think and behave like that. And then my six year old asked me, the mom, if we take, if people take vaccines, then, uh, or people have the vaccines, then we could go outside more and life could start getting back to normal. And I said, yeah, 
And why did I hear that the president refused the vaccines? And how, how am I going to justify that? Like, no explanation. He's only six years old and he can make better decisions than our president at the moment. So <laughs> it's very difficult. And I don't know, I would like to listen a little about your experience because I know you're in Chile and it's not so, uh, your reality is not so far from ours. Uh, how was it to to be there and to have an um, organization and to be like probably struggling but still fighting and not uh, so hopeless about mm -hmm. the whole uh, political situation at the moment. And thank you so much for sharing your <laughs> experience. Thank you, Manu, very much for uh, for your comment and yeah, sharing your experience also. Um, first is um, you never should lose hope. I think hope is so important. As I said, I remember this title, Not All the Hope is Outside. That is Norwegian book. And what happened to me actually was that I, I went to work for the German government uh, to Honduras. And I, I, they wanted me to develop a toolkit for children and uh, to improve the education. I, actually, it had to do with, with orchards and different uh, pers perspectives on, on how to, to work with children. Uh, and coming from Norway, I was living there before, um, I had prohibited to walk outside. I, I had to be only uh, driven by you know by someone from the from the organization from door to door um, every people were i mean not everyone but a lot of people were all uh, guns with arms you know in the restaurant two guys with uh, guns uh, outside and then in the middle and inside and everywhere every every store had uh, people with guns in in the entrance um, I had a very bad experience, actually, and it was so bad um, that I, I, I said to myself, like, you have to go to Chile and take children outside, because that will help to create a better atmosphere outside. I mean, there is this, the, this idea, what's first, the egg or, you know, the hand, and, and you have to yeah, we don't know, but the way we can act is uh, to bring children outside. And in Chile, we have obviously very difficult uh, areas with a lot of uh, trafficking, drugs, uh, you know, violence. Actually, there, there, I visited a, a childcare center that has this uh, special glass, thick glass, you know, all the walls are specially protected. So all the bullets are, don't enter inside. Um, yeah, there, there we brought some trees actually. Yeah, and, and we helped them to, to understand that it's important to go outside with the children. And for that you have to, it sounds, I don't know if you have to convince the parents. I mean, of course you have to convince, but it's not the, the way I think you should work is you have to, talk to them and talk about the benefits and how children feel better and how, what, what happens to them. Uh, and this is, um, at the end, you have to talk with, with the community. No? It, it is not that you have to convince one person, it's the, uh, the community that has to be convinced that this is good. Uh, the teachers, the parents, the children themselves. Mm. I think when, when you start is always, always the starting is the most difficult part. I, I was invited to do some, mm, some workshops on a poor neighborhood over here by a municipality, which yeah, has no, not much money and, uh, they had also drug uh, problems. And so we went to, with the teaching, we, we were half of the day inside talking and, you know, like sharing experiences, crying a little bit. Uh, and then 
I decided to take them for a walk. So we went outside and we had a walk and there was this hill close. So we went to the hill and they, they said, I've never been here. And it was like two blocks from the, <laughs> I couldn't believe it that they wouldn't, I mean, they've never been there with the children. So I, I said to them, bring uh, natural materials. So what could you bring and work with the children, you know, start to prepare figures and, and crafts. And they enjoyed a lot. They enjoyed a lot. They, they gave me very good feedback. And then I left, I was living in another city, so I had to leave. And then I came back, I had another workshop. And then like two years later, I knew the teachers of school started to have a, a yeah, um, like they, they, they went outside periodically. Yeah, they started to go outside to this hill. Actually, nowadays they write uh, experiences, what's happening there. And it's not only the school now, the, um, well, the major had also clever, he, a good uh, politician and uh, not uh, like the, your president. Um, he had the idea to plant uh, native trees. So they, they started the development and as I said, we are more and more. So other organizations are taking part. They are taking, there are these nice Instagrams, uh, you know, pages where they show a lot of nature, what's happening here, for example, in the river, which is very polluted. And they are showing that's polluted, but they are showing you nice birds. They are showing you amazing insects with so beautiful colors uh, and, plants, you know, and uh, flowers, wild flowers that are growing. And this organization, actually I'm having a meeting here on Monday and I invited them. So we are starting to have uh, talkings and they, they, they started also to, to have an agreement with the municipality so they can take uh, families uh, outside to the river, which is, imagine it has been it's very different than in, Germ in Germany and Europe in the north. But when you go south in Europe, like Italy, Greece, I, I guess Spain, I don't know so much, but it's very, the rivers are very polluted. Uh, so I guess in Brazil too. So it's a very polluted river, but they are starting to go, you know, and to say, hey, it's not so unsafe uh, to go there, children are enjoying, they were playing like fishing, you know, I saw these nice pictures. Um, and actually an experience that happened to myself, I went with a group of children to, to a park, a small park in a small city, uh, and there were two guys drinking beer. They, were, they, they had some, you know, drinking, uh, sitting there, and we arrived and they left the place. I saw them and I was like, oh, I'm like, what's happening here? So we, we, they started to play in the play facilities and these two guys st stood up and they left the, the park. And I was impressed. And I, I said to myself, we had an impact here. It's not the same to stay inside then with fear because I'm, of course, many things can happen and Brazil, some areas are for sure more violent than others. When I was in Honduras, they killed Berta Cáceres one week before I arrived. You know Berta Cáceres? It was this Goldman uh, Prize winner for the ecology, you know, a very important indigenous. Um, that nobody heard much more than she was like an ecologist and defending the rivers and the and water. Uh, but, but when I was there, they told me, she maybe would have been president of Honduras. I mean, you know, the media didn't say that, that she maybe became president, that people were talking that she could be president. And that's why they killed her, I think. Mm, because it's, imagine to have a pro-ecologist, indigena president in the middle of uh, Central America. So of course, things can happen. You have to take the risk, I think, and make an evaluation, what's happening outside, where am I going, when is it more dangerous or not, talking, investigate, research, and then getting the agreement of the community and you can start to do that. I think that's the way, but 
staying inside is not bringing any change. It's, it's making only things worse because again, going to the benefits, you know, they are learning more, they are growing better. So all the benefits they are losing staying inside and also the social benefits. I've been talking now a bit more related to the uh, experiencing the city. So if we want nice cities, and yeah, you have to go outside. You, fear, fear is, is a, a very important emotion that you have to, it makes you aware, you know, and then you have to act accordingly, uh, cautious and do things uh, to leave that zone and not imagine living in fear your whole life. This is the worst can happen. Leaving you, I mean, at the end, I actually in Honduras, I was walking and I, I had a very nice experience. I had to leave the country because um, my boss told me also related to democracy because I wanted to, you know, push things further. And yeah, I, I had uh, well some, uh, I, I will go to the point. So I had to leave. Um, after yeah, that my boss told me you have to leave. It's too diff it's too dangerous. You know what you've been doing is maybe pushing too much. And this coming from Norway, I felt very safe. Like I, I talked to everyone, like you know, very equal. Uh, and then um, I left to to Nicaragua and I stayed there working in a municipality. I, I was very lucky actually. I think uh, and I had a very nice experience there. But then I came back to Honduras. Uh, as a tourist, because of my flight was leaving from Honduras, you know, so I, I had to, I, I stayed six months, uh, most of it in Nicaragua, but when I came back, I met a friend from Honduras in the bus, and he invited me to, to sleep at his place, uh, and we went out, and we were eating, and I was just walking through the streets, and I enjoy Honduras so much, like, only, unfortunately, the last time, when I was not like the government uh, important person, you know, I was just a normal tourist uh, and, and nothing happened. Of course, things can always happen, but if you have your local, you know, I, I had this local person who told me nothing will happen here, I trust him. So it's the same, if your neighborhood is unsafe, check real facts, what's happening, when, talk with the neighbors, uh, and uh, there you can, I think, start uh, to go outside and, and be outside and enjoy it, you know, and spread the word so others do it also. Hmm. Yeah, something else? Somebody wants to say something, Tanya? Yeah. I always have things to say. <laughs> Uh, actually, I have a question to Manu, uh, and uh, I think, um, Matthias, you gave a number of very good suggestions, but uh, I can imagine that it's in Brazil, um, like we can recommend with all our very nice uh, first world countries to do this and that, and then it, the situation is really different and how to manage that. So it's, I can imagine, well, I, no, actually I cannot imagine your situation, but I have a question. Can you, are there places that, um, that you can maybe go there for a longer time for like take a whole day picnic to go mm -hmm. maybe Uber, pack the, the basket with things. And of course with Matthias and we all recommend to go every day, small, you know, to be outside every day, but if it's not possible to make maybe a happening and go to some uh, mountain or I don't know where, maybe for the whole day and then it maybe will be safe, but I don't know how it is. I, uh, you probably know better. And then you could completely focus and concentrate on that positive environment when it's there, you know, and then take the Uber that your children <laughs> suggest to take there and back to start with. I don't know, uh, what, what do you think? Uh, actually, we do that. Like we we live in Salvador, which is by the sea, and we go to the beach, for example, quite often. And also, I travel with them quite a lot to the countryside, and we do things like that. But I think my worry is more uh, getting these into their routine, and not only about them, 
but I, I do feel like uh, it should be something for everybody. I am also a teacher and I, I feel like uh, our children, especially now, especially during the pandemic, especially um, during this whole political crisis and economical crisis that the country has been through and cities have become more violent and parents are more afraid of letting children out, even to where it used to be safe places. So it's a more general worry than their situation. I do feel worried after what happened that they now are scared of walking uh, in our streets. And I feel this is very bad because it's where they live, right? And they spent a, a month without sleeping by themselves because whenever they could see the, the police car, the lights, the police car lights or anything like that, they would get scared that there was something happening. So this is a, a level of stress that I think no children uh, should go through, even though I know my children are very privileged. Because if I think about like violent areas in the city and Salvador is a very poor city, uh, they don't, children don't have any peace. If you watch the news, the local news, you'd get scared. And even the schools, the kindergartens, they get mugged and robbed every day. All the materials, the, so, even their, their playgrounds are stolen. So uh, this is the kind of environment, it's our reality in the cities in Brazil. The countryside, maybe depending on where, is not so bad, but the cities are getting a very uh, stressful and dangerous place for everybody, especially for children, I think. <laughs> it's, you know, it's there you have this inequality uh, problem. I mean, it's uh, too much. I mean, the politics have not been able to, yeah, to make it a little bit more equal, and, and that, that's also very important, and it's what we observe, actually, when you go to where this uh, approach comes from, it's from countries that have a much more uh, equal society. Um, but in that case, as I learned a little bit capoeira, uh, they should go into a capoeira group and then they will have no problems unless they meet the next gang or something like that. No, maybe, <laughs> maybe that could be a solution. I mean, it's also, for example, when you said Brazil, and I, I was thinking about favelas, no, how, how can you go outside in favelas? But in the favelas, they all know each other, so they have their it's not that they have violence. Uh, um, but it's changing too. The, They're having violence among the neighbors as well. Like it's been common in Salvador the past week. They are invading houses. Uh, yeah. People from the community are invading houses in the community to run away from the police, and the police invade the houses as well. So it's becoming very crazy, even inside the communities where. The logic was that, like people who lived there, they were safe, but not anymore. Not anymore. Not anymore. Mm. <laughs> I wanted to visit Salvador. <laughs> you should come. It's a place that is <laughs> yeah. like, it, I, it I really is like in some initiatives like this, like even on the private education, we don't have anything like trying to think about freedom or democratic education at all it's uh, that's why i'm homeschooling because i can't really find any any in uh, educational environment that i think it's near democracy yeah. or respectful towards children development <laughs> mm -hmm. it's a pity it's a so sad uh, situation but we have to Again, we have to look forward. We have to believe that it will become better. If not, uh, life is too hard. You know, we have to, yeah. Ciao, Tania. Yeah, maybe we leave all, but we, yeah. Ah, Gabriel, Gabriel. Well, the thing with the cities, I think, I mean, it's hard to say because when was it a few years ago that over 50% of the world's population is living in cities, right? So, yeah. but um, 
from a um, ecological point of view i mean i wonder are cities really a sustainable um like system you know because they depend from the resources of of the rural areas so yeah. i mean th this is the question i ask myself i mean cities are highly artificial highly fragile um like systems mm. so, and th th i mean there's a lot of crazy shit are going on and they're really like um like insane places in many aspects not just in brazil even in wealthy countries if you look in how people um develop in cities the culture which happens there i mean it's it's i don't want to be too simplistic but just ecologically and and um energetically are cities really sustainable or will this system collapse you know because they are so highly depending from the surroundings. So this is also a question because when we talk about education, we talk about social transformation and what kind of um, society model are we looking for? And are cities really sustainable? Is the city life, I mean, this is really a topic, a topic what I'm just saying, but I think these are valid questions for the future. I, I don't know if I could uh, make my point, but um, I don't know, it's far away and very topic because more than 50% of the people live in cities, but um, yeah, I'm very critical with cities. Sorry. Uh, good point, Gabriel. Uh, I was going to say, I know here in the US there's some cities that are very advanced in the green movement. They do a lot of rooftop, like Portland. Oregon, there's some places where they're doing amazing things. So I think it depends on the community, the city, and if they can work together, um, if they can build a community and have ideas that are progressive and that want to improve. Because um, here in Texas, there's not much of that. Um, but up in like the, the West Coast, there, there is more of that, of them trying to just improve the community and make it more sustainable. Um, but that's a community-based approach where a lot of the people are trying to do that. I, I just want to say that um, what I was talking about is um, early childhood education, although I talk of, yeah, also for other um, older children and young people. But um, I mean, cities are the, a disaster. They, they are consumption consuming everything from the inland. Um, but there is this idea of uh, biophilic cities, you know, that, that I was, I, I mentioned a little bit. Um, and I, I think the way of bringing children outside the kindergarten and, you know, use the parks, use uh, the natural environments that you can find in the city or also maybe a little bit more apart. Um, it's a way to, to create awareness and um, that we start to make cities greener. Uh, it's part of it. I mean, you have that, that's, if cities have so, uh, so few yeah, parks or, or green areas is because we also forgot that it is important. I mean, we have been dealing with this educational system so, so long. Uh, even talking, I, I mean, I was teaching in a university and we had this, um, you know, uh, um, meetings talking how, how will we change what we are doing, but they have been teaching 20 years, 15 years, and they are not able to disconnect from only lo looking at I'm teaching uh, language, you know, so they 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 can't integrate um, math or you know the physical experiences. Uh, so it's all, especially I'm talking now, a very uh, young people. I mean, children, young children, you know, early education. So it's all playing. It's all much more about playing, free play, and 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 then connecting the different uh, fields. But they were not able because they are teaching like I'm teaching, you know, math. So this is math uh, how you teach uh, for in in uh, early, um, yeah, childhood or early education. Um, 
but then the model is is wrong again because the students are listening to the old model and all separated and not integrated so when they have to when they go back or they go or they start to in the kindergarten they also have this now i'm teaching let's say spanish or and then oh now i will teach math and i and, it, and it, it's completely disconnected the experience this is the nice thing about nature pedagogy, which is a lot of, about integrating everything and playing. And then you are more the one who is ah, maybe here I should do this and that, you know, like oh, helping, guiding. Uh, but, but just coming back, so these experiences in nature, having an orchard, going to the park, um, creating awareness about nature in general, can help to create cities that integrate this into their policies, you know, and this way uh, having a more biophilic cities. I think it's a, a whole uh, research topic, you know, it's very, very complex. Yeah, it's, but uh, I mean, have you wondered that um, when we talk about sustain sustainability and you, yourself, you said at the beginning of your talk, like it's urgent, we have to act now. But this has been like around like the, the climate change and the, the need to change has been like for 20 or 30 years already. I mean, it's nothing new. I like the new tribe. Yeah. yeah, even more like since the 70s, right? The Cup of mm. Rome. Well, but it's, it's been popular since the 90s or, or whatever, you know. But haven't you noticed that there's like, um, it was really hard for me to find like precise um, data or recommendations of how much we would need to change because there's this kind of um, what we call techno optimism, which is like this green type technology, which yeah, is sold yeah. to us. And this, yeah. for example, this green, this green uh, cities. So we will develop cities which will be sustainable but nobody talks about how much we really have to reduce our impact and our ecological footprint. Where, where have you seen like a number on, on data, how much we have to reduce our consumption, for example, our impact. And I just found like years ago, I found like one number of Germany where it said like, we would need to reduce our consumption. I think it was 80 or 90%. And it, it was just talking about equal like, um, resource like uh, justice it was not even talking about uh, sustainability on a long term so i think this is like a real um yeah more than tendency to have this techno optimism and mm. um talking back to education and the um, nature pedagogy and also the whole alternative um education movement that of course it's a big step um it, it's a big um, improvement to have these kids in nature or have the kids in, in democratic schools, for example. But the problem that I see, one of the very central problems, is that they almost have no references of alternative um, life models. There's like, okay, I know that we should have a better world, but at the end, I go back into the conventional channels of the free market or whatever, because I don't have like models, for example, and here I see the value of like eco village movement, but they're very, very little and almost nobody knows them. And the kids don't have these references as a model to see, ah, okay, another lifestyle is possible. So even if we have nature kindergartens and nature schools and democratic schools, most of these young people, okay, they will be have a little bit more open minded spirits, they will be a little bit more democratic, but most of them keep on with a conventional lifestyle, which is consuming the same amount of resources, which has almost the same. And we know this, like in Germany, there has been like, for, for now decades, like uh, ecologists, like um, like a, a talk, everybody talks about nature. And of course, there are little steps, but it's by far not enough. And we talk, when we talk about education, okay, we, we do some steps. But if we see how urgent it is, it's not enough. And we, we need to offer the kids like um, references and role models of different uh, lifestyles, which really make a change. And yeah, I, I think this I, is really, really I, I agree completely I with you. Yeah. I agree completely. Uh, 
but I have, I, I mean, we are leaving again the topic. Maybe we can have a, a glass of wine and talk about it. In I hope <laughs> in another opportunity. I I would like to to end the conversation because it's we can talk about the economy and I mean you you, you said it, but I I I, I, I just want to say that I learned the Anthropocene term by chance. Actually, I was in, in Berlin and I, I, I arrived to a conference and I was walking and I saw a museum uh, house the, the Kultur der Welten or Kultur der Welten. And I went inside and they had this Anthropocene exposition. And then this was in 2000, I think it was 2015 only and i read that and i never heard about it before anthropocene and it happened to me something very special because i went out and i started to walk and i saw you know it rains a lot in in germany uh, so there was this worm on the sidewalk and unfortunately i yeah, stop on it. So, you know, I, I kill it. And I was, and I noticed, wow, this is my footprint, you know, <laughs> like this is exactly, I just killed a worm. Uh, and this is part of my footprint. And I, I went one meter more and I found a bracelet, you know, uh, like a rainbow bracelet made with uh, um, yeah, nylon or something, you know, like wool. In, in different colors and it was the same size as the worm and then i said yeah but we have we have footprint and we have handprint you know and then i search and the term of course exists um but what i want to say is that we still have our hands we still can do something you know we, and we we have to also um as manu said like i, I i'm with fear but or you are saying we are not acting fast enough, but we don't. We have to still uh, have a good life for ourselves and try to be aware and try to do as much as you can, but still having your own life and rhythm and enjoying it. You know, like not because otherwise we can live in an in an anxiety. We can live like I'm not doing enough. We are not good enough. Um, and I, I, I had the same experience. I mean, that's why CIFREP also exists somehow, because I, I wanted to do something. I wanted to help this world. But, but still, I, I need to be calm and help from my contentness and calmness to, to the children. And, you know, I'm not, uh, I, I, I think we have to grow in them this hope that the world can be better and, and that we are doing that and, the, and that you can enjoy life still in this world. Maybe, for example, I try uh, actually these last years not to fly so much. I mean, with COVID now it has been impossible, uh, but I was thinking like we should have alternatives like what Greta has given us, no? the going with the boat. Uh, there should be much, maybe much more boats that brings bring people from one side to the other, and you enjoy the traveling. And it's not like this fast society. I have to be there in sixteen hours or whatever. And I mean, talking about Chile is all very far, you know. Brazil, Salvador is like eight hours, I think. Um, so it's very uh, important, I think, to to keep calm. Oh, my light is gone. <laughs> it's too dark, dark here with my turn. Okay. So now the, the sun is here disappearing. Um, yeah, so calmness is also part of education, the rhythm, you know, this uh, pedagogia del caracol. You know, I have a book somewhere there. Yeah, Savaloni talks about how everyone has his rhythm and uh, it's a Italian educator. And um, so you, you have to try to live with this calmness, Gabriel, I think. Do as much as you can, but 
from you know from being here and now and, and not being desperate because the world is too big for you it's too big for all of us i mean we can do a lot and we are impacting the world we're having an impact and we have to value all the little things we can do and this is this is also enough i don't know if it yeah. helps you i think uh, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm calm when I'm in the morning with the kids at the seaside. There, I'm calm. But when I'm in an international congress, which is worldwide connecting education movement, and we realize, hey, we are like um, not, for example, we're talking right now about the nature movement, and the rage, nature movement is not really, um, not even not doing enough. It's not like thinking enough, you know, because we don't talk sufficiently not critical enough about our own lifestyle i'm not talking about getting hectic i'm talking about being honest and looking at reality and this is not really happening and of course some people get anxious talking about like um this this things and it's it's not very comfortable but this is where i well of, of course we can go on like calm but um i think um the stress will get us sooner or later you know it's um... yeah but i i i agree but look i i just have a book here actually it's in a language i think you love maybe you can translate it das überleben sichern to um, ensure the survival yeah and it's a book uh, that is written in part by willy brandt no, it's from the 80s and it's talking about the industry and the development and everything. So it's, it's, this is also an idea that the whole life, I mean, as a species, we have been talking about survival and that we, we will die or, you know, like the Romans and the going to the uh, barbarian and I, I I I think it's I agree we we have to make this movement grow faster. Leslie now I'm so happy that Leslie's here because we we have been talking just a few uh, months ago and and we are starting to develop the foundation in Ecuador with her. You know for, and for me that's the way I can help the movement to improve to grow. I wish we could be in Brazil and in uh, Spain and the US and, and help as organization to build like a real movement like Fridays for Future is doing, for example, they are doing an amazing job. Um, but this now oriented to nature education, early years and then school, you know, and young people and, and eco villaggio, they say in, in Italy, I remember. Um, well, if you want to do more, we can. I can leave uh, here actually my email, and we can start the contact, and we can do more more things. You know, I'm happy. I'm a, actually you are German. I I didn't know. Uh, I'm German too, also, and Chilean, and and Spanish. You know, Brazil is just here on the corner. Um, the US, they have a lot of money. Maybe Jason can send us money so we can do more stuff. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, yeah. but, but again, uh, but, but again but, for me, it's not necessarily about. <laughs> it's not money, it's not right? About it's about doing, doing things, uh, organizing, and yeah. I mean, we we should do more stuff together. Well, no, but, yeah, but not just necessarily more. Of course, more. But for example, the the nature education movement is not yet really connected. For example, to the eco village uh, model. You know, when we talk about nature education, we will still talk a lot about like painting letters on stones or counting with sticks. You know, this is what nature education is most people about. And and the children breathe free air, but not but almost nobody talks about connecting education to, to eco village movement, for example. And this is about content. This is not about doing more. This is about um, looking uh, like further this 
perspectives about lifestyle, not just about learning, how kids learn in nature, about the whole lifestyle. This is what I mean, and this is what I'm missing in this movement, for example. Yeah, but, but that there, I, I believe, I mean, I have the hope that just being in nature and creating all this awareness, as, as we were saying, children become better learners. You know, they learn more, they are, they are more conscious. So it should develop in its own pace as we do our work also. Um, I, that's my hope. Uh, I hope I can die with that hope very strong in my heart or see the results. And I, but <laughs> I hope we don't run out of time. Yeah, I, yeah. I hope, uh, I hope not. Mm, but I want to Thank send you. you an email because this is a way we, we can do something. So Manu, I have your email. Gabriel, if you leave your email there in the chat. Uh, Jason, uh, Leslie, I have your email. Um, yeah, we can, I mean, it's important to, to do things, I think also to conceptualize, of course, you know, what does it mean? And that's why also I'm, I'm not leaving the academy. Like I'm actually doing a research with the university and talking with another university and seeing stuff. Um, it's, um, but, but yeah. But the, I think nowadays, the most important thing from this perspective here in, in Chile and what I've been experiencing is that most of the people, they don't know what a nature kindergarten is. So we are in that level. So talking about a whole change of life and you know, it's, I hope it's not too, so, <laughs> it's not too late. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think it's, again, very important. If, if I wouldn't believe we can do it or we can manage, I, I would live in stress, a lot of stress. So I prefer to calm down and try to, you know, live with more contentness. Like I know I can do any, I can do so many things. I can do a lot of things, but I'm human. I have my resources. I have to sleep. And actually I should sleep much more and work much less and, and i'm i'm <laughs> i'm telling this actually with a lot of people i work people i love uh, i live with you know like because it's i have to stop working so much and i said before like my goal is to work four days uh, a week and six hours because that will bring also a uh, more well-being to my life and maybe i will be on that small time, much more efficient with children and bring much more things with them, you know, or research much more in deep or because I will be in nature again, I will be more in nature, relaxed and thinking, well, maybe the same problems, but in a more relaxed way, in a more, so it's, it's a, yeah, it's a paradigm shift, a, a general, not only in education, social, economic and political, and it's, uh, this is a, but we have been talking about crisis, like in this economical, political, you know, like also many years, many years. So we'll see. We, we are part of the change and we have to enjoy. The more we enjoy it, the better the change will be, I think. And, and to enjoy it, we have to have more, the more free time to, to experience nature relax, going camping, you know, like, yeah. Well, it's like Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. And I think many of us, I mean, when we talk about education, education should be self-education. And I think many of us are still very far away from being coherent, right? So, um, yeah, we're gonna mm. ourselves, not, not so much doing so much to change the world, do more to change ourselves. This should I, be the first step always. We're working so much here on all these topics, like actually how I behave and I can be a better person just with the person I, I'm looking at, you know, that you meet, just being nice and, and 
yeah, listening in, in, in real, like having time to be with the other people. It's, uh, we live in a very frenetic world. Like all, I don't know, like so many messages sometimes, you know, you, you go, uh, yeah, you go dinner and you, you see the people uh, or yourself and you're in the cell phone and you're criticizing but maybe the others didn't check in the whole day and they were together doing another stuff and you're, ah, oh, but they are just looking at the cell phone. You know, we don't know really so many things. So I, I really believe like we, we should try to act with our heart and, and be content and be here present and, um, and do as much as you can, but also uh, try to relax and to have your spare time, your free time to enjoy and do all the other things because it's so important it's about life and live we are not too late mm. at least look at this if we are present when we die it's not so terrible i think okay okay i will die and yeah um but again very important this ecophobia thing like i mean children should have the best the childhood we can give them and that's outside playing. You. Okay, I, I also want to go home. I guess, uh, Gabriel, it's quite late over there. Uh, Manu, I guess it's also quite late over there, no? It's eight o'clock. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Brazil, Brasilia time? Yes, yes, eight in the evening. 20, <laughs> it's eight. Yeah, it's yes, right yes. Yeah. yeah, but thank you very much for all the discussion, for this conversation. It's very, very nice. And I have your email, so I will send you right now um, an email and we keep in touch and we can maybe have a group and discuss again and meet and what yeah. we can do together. And because also I think we have a lot of, of the movement also is so spread that we have to unite more like this national associations, uh, I think, are, they are playing a quite interesting role, but how do they connect internationally also is very important, you know, and, and have uh, big events and yeah, meet with people, have an impact on media, um, social media also is so important to do. And Jason is in a tent now, I mean, <laughs> that's amazing. What is name? Yeah, backyard camp out. Wow. Hey. Oh, you're saying hi, bud. <laughs> How are you? I guess what he wants to connect too. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. He'll tell me sometimes. I know um, I, he'll say, no phone, daddy, no phone. And I'm like, okay, put it down. Yeah. Um, that's how I bad know. the distraction yeah. it can be. So. Yeah, yeah. so, well, y'all have a good night. Me? Thank you. It was wonderful. Good night. Thank you very much. Keep in touch. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>